You ever, uh, you ever build a little sandcastle? You ever do that? How many of you have ever done that? How many of you did it since you've been an adult? Uh, yeah, okay, okay, some of you honest, all right. I don't know that I ever really built a sandcastle, but I remember, you know, having one of those plastic buckets and all that and packing it full of sand and turning it upside down and putting a few of them up, and I wasn't terribly artistic, you know, but... Uh, you ever notice when the, when the waves come in, or the, if you were on the ocean, when the tide comes in, it starts to erode, it kind of just dissolves, collapses, and goes back to just being like all the other grains of sand. I want you to keep that, that, little, that little image maybe in the, the back of your mind this morning as we look at these scriptures. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is speaking, and he says this in verse, what we know as verse 24. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, say, and does them. That's the challenging part, isn't it? Yeah, we can hear it and we can read it, but to do them that's where the rubber meets the road. That's the collision of our will and our choosing and the activation of our faith, you know, is in what we do in response to his word. So he says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. Not a wise guy. A little different context. A wise man, a wise woman, a wise person who built their house on the rock. There's a distinct difference of what happens when I put something on the sand and I look at the waves come in and what happens compared to when the waves come in against the rocks. It's a distinct difference. If you want to build something, you want to have something succeed. You want something to stand the test, right? Manufacturers know this, right? You, you're making something, you manufacture it. Well, you put it under stress to find out how much it can take because it needs to take more than what the normal use of that product will be in the market and in the lives of people, right? Right? You got to test. You you manufacturing a table, or you're building a table at home. You, you better you better stress check that. Be a terrible thing to build a table and then set some valuable stuff on it, like a nice cake with a few pies. I always like to talk about food. One, because I like it, and two, it's almost lunchtime and. You know, kind of gets you hungry. Er. Yeah, you, you don't want that table to collapse. Last thing I want to do is put tools on a table that's going to collapse. I hate picking up sockets all over the floor. You ever have one of those and it flops open and all the socket? Oh, yeah. Yep, yeah, I've had a few fall out. I don't know if my dad's watching, but I remember when he said, yeah, I told him about the case, the handle. I said, come on, come on, now, th- no, that, you can't just pick it up by the handle, you've got to clasp those, ah, you picked it up by the handle, the thing fell open, my sockets were all over the driveway. I want you to know it was a great moment. See, all my life I had to listen to him. And then he didn't listen to me. And I was right. (laughs) For once. (laughs) What kind of case is this? (laughs) You know, that uh, wasn't his fault. It was a case of fault. Nobody's watching. I had to get a little fun. I'm sure my mom will go home and tell him she's here. Uh, Those fun moments. Here's Jesus. He's saying, listen, you hear my words, but the person who does them is a wise man who, like, builds his house on a rock. 
so that when the rain comes and the floods come and the winds blow and beat on that house, it will not fall because the foundation was on a rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, does not do them, they will be like a foolish man. Say wise man. Wise. Say foolish man. foolish man. Which one do you want to be? If you don't do these words that we hear from Jesus, we will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the rains came and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, it fell. And great was the fall of that house. We've probably heard that story a lot throughout our life. I want to tie it into something this morning, you know. We're, we're all kind of looking, right? We're, we're, we're kind of made to want better. For things to be better. For things to improve that the later things would be greater than the former things. It's the progression that we sense, you know. It's the great industrial revolution, you know. It's technology. It's uh, life. Uh, it might be I want a, uh, you know, a, a better house. I may want a better this or I want, you know, to do those things. You know, the motivations vary for you know, what we, what we want. Um, motivations can be corrupt. They can be just simple. They can be pure. Um, they can be things that we want better that we draft a plan for. And, uh, you know, we, we want, we, you know, we're, we want a utopia. You know, we, for, I'll put it in these terms, you know, we, we want heaven on earth. We want a good experience. We want to be protected. We want to be safe. We want to be healthy. We want all of these things. And that's, that's not wrong. But understand that God, God created us and put that in us. You, you hear this. He put that within us. Now, we corrupt it, but he put that in us for this very reason, that we would long for heaven. that we would long for him and that we would discover apart from him there will be no utopia. You, you and I cannot have heaven apart from God. Listen, you, you and I, we cannot have a better America apart from God. You can't have a better education apart from God. You can't have a wonderful family and all of this apart from God. It doesn't mean that if God, you know, is in our life that we won't have challenges or we won't have difficulties or, you know, uh, the, the storms and the rain won't come. But what I will tell you that uh, apart from God... We build on the sand. When we do things God's way, when we hear his words and we do them, we build on a rock because storms are going to come, right? Who here hasn't had a personal storm or difficulty or challenge or failure or trial or testing? We all have. What are we going to build on? The interesting thing is that he says, those who hear my words, I don't, I don't want us to overlook that. He says, those who hear my words, you see, his words provide life and direction and instruction. And if we hear them and we live by them and we do them, we're not doing this life and building whatever we think is better. We're not doing it apart from him. You and I cannot build a better life apart from God. 
And yet we want a utopia, we want a heaven, or we want it to be better. Whatever better is in your mind over what area of life it is, your perspective. I'm just telling you that better, apart from God, will not happen. You know, <clears throat> Hebrews 11 says something about an Old Testament guy named Abraham. And I'm going to just refresh you a little bit. God told Abraham to pack everything up and be on the move. And when, because God was moving Abraham, taking him to where another piece of land, another place. And he didn't tell Abraham where it was. He just said, go. And Abraham had to listen to God so that when he arrived where God wanted him to be, God would tell him and Abraham would listen. And this is what Abraham was looking for. Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10. It says this. That Abraham was looking for a city or a place whose builder and maker was God. You see, that's the place that's better. It's better, not apart from God, but with God, in God, His direction, His Word. I don't know what in your life you're trying to make better, but I want you to know that if you do it apart from God, it will not be better. It will not be better. You can have signs where it looks like it's pleasing you and you're accomplishing it and it's looking good and all of this, but I want you to know if you have done that man-made thing apart from God, I don't care how good it looks to the natural eye, I want you to know that it's not best and it's not better apart from God. Those of you who have faith in God, have you, you acquainted with doing things on your own? You see, the Bible says this in Proverbs, that there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. It leads to destruction. It leads to failure. It leads to no inheritance. Nothing left, nothing good. You see, I want us to grasp the understanding when, when we look at the phrase, we can't make things better apart from God. I want us to understand apart, that, that word, apart, apart from him. It, it means that we're doing things our own way and not God's way. That we are taking things into our own hand. We are putting great trust in our own ingenuity, our own scheme, our own blueprint, our own abilities, and frankly, it doesn't really matter what God has to say. I like this. I like how I see the finished product in my mind. I like the process I have. That's my way. I want you to know that it will not be better and it will not stand unless you and I build on the rock. Building on the rock is doing it God's way, God's word and doing it according to him. Not thinking that we know better. You, you can think about things in your life like, um, I don't know, maybe relationships. They did this, I got hurt, I'm mad. I'll show them. I'm going to hold a grudge, I'm going to have resentment. After all, they were the one that was wrong, therefore I have the right to feel this way, and I am more superior than they are. Tell me where that's found in here. Tell me how that is better than how God tells us to deal when somebody hurts us. Tell me how that's better. See, that's apart from God. This, this is we hear his word, though my flesh wants to do something else, my will wants to do something else, I hear his word, but I choose to do his word over choosing what my natural tendencies are to do. Proverbs 16, it says, Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Now, when we commit something to the Lord, that's not coming up with our own plan 
saying, oh God, I pray to you, I call upon you, I really like this plan, I think it's a great idea, could you just put your blessing on it so I can go do my own thing? That's not committing your work, your plan, your blueprint, your draft, that is not committing. When I do that, that is not committing my way to the Lord. It's not trying to get his blessing on my will. That's not committing my way to the Lord. It has to do with commitment. I commit myself to his ways so that as I carry out the plan, it's not just my plan and my will. It has to do with his direction and his revelation to me and that when I carry out the plan that I do it according to the integrity of who he is. I don't do side door scheming and a back door handshake and do illegal things and things that are not proper for a believer. No, I'm going to commit. Yeah, but if I do this, I can save money. I could make more money. And that looks like success to me. God says that, no, you're, you're doing things that are not pleasing to me. And at that moment, we chose, do I obey his word, or is, or is money my God? Or is my will and my pleasure my God? I prayed about it. Well, just because you and I pray about something doesn't mean that God gave his approval on my desire or my will. If it goes outside his parameters, his instruction, his counsel, then we're not committing our plans to the Lord. We just talked to him about our plans, tried to get his quick blessing so we could run down the road with our own deal. And it talks about <clears throat> apart from God or with God. Understand that it's about not just the praying, it's about upholding his word in our life, that we look like him. We look like his ambassador, we look like his servant, we look like someone from his kingdom. We look like someone from his region. We look like someone who knows his word, not by what we say only, but by what we do. You see, that's the wise man. That's the man that the Lord commends. That's the man that the Lord gives favor to. James says something interesting in chapter 1. I want to read it to you, verse 7. I'll start with verse 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. It, it's a double-minded guy, right? Right? I, I, want to, I want to express to you what double-minded is. It's not just wishy-washy, do I believe in God, don't I believe in God? It, it's, it's, not just, it's, it's not just that. It's the guy, it's the person who prays, talks to God, seeks his blessing over something, and then walks in it but takes it into his own hands because now he's not thinking that God is really going to help him or God is not really going to give his blessing. I can't really trust God in this. It isn't happening fast enough. It's not unfolding like I wanted. Therefore, I'm going to take this into my own hands. And all of a sudden, we're doing this apart from him. I don't care what it is in life, how we make decisions. Because it says this, look at, watch this. It says, for the person who is all of a sudden driven and tossed about, do I follow God or do I do my own thing? For that person must not suppose that they will receive anything from the Lord. That person, they shouldn't, they, they shouldn't think that they're going to receive anything from the Lord. 
We ask him, we talk to him, we go to church, we throw a few bucks in the offering, we might even volunteer, we do a couple nice things for people, and, you know, we, we look like the part. But when it comes to making a decision or doing something in our life or drafting a plan or trying to, uh, you know, get, make something better, and we don't, we feel like if I do it God's way, it's just not going to look as appealing to me. It's not going to feel as comfortable to me. It's, and so therefore, now we kind of do a little God thing and we do a lot of us thing. For that person, they're double-minded. They should not, that person, if I do that, I should not suppose that I should really receive anything from the Lord. Because I'm double-minded and it says this. That person is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. You see, if we're not faithful in that, any other thing that will come along, in our mind, God's word will always be very subjective to us. In other words, where I find it easy and where I agree with it and where I seem to not struggle with obeying him, I'll do it. And the places where I do, I try to take that scripture and manipulate it so it looks like I'm not disobeying God and then I get this false permission in my mind to go ahead and do this. That person, how can, how can they ever expect to receive anything from the Lord? If I do that, how can I suppose that things are gonna go good, things that somehow things are gonna be better? Let me throw, it out, let me throw this out to you. Male, female, they fight each other, like each other, have a relation with each other. It's progressing. They're in love. They say, you know, and we believe in the Lord. We go to church. God understands because we really love each other. We're going to move in together. They're going to play house. They're going to play husband and wife. They're going to have intimacy in every way. Now, we know that that's outside of God's word. Yeah, but God understands. And, you know, he's gracious. And Wait a minute. That, that's, not his, that's not his word. Those who hear my word and do it are wise. I want you to know, how can you think things are going to be better? How can I think things are going to be better? <laughs> and I just built on sand. Because when the storm comes... The difficulties come. The destruction will happen. It will not stand the test. Because we didn't do it his way. You can change the, the situation. It doesn't have to be male and female. It doesn't have to be a relationship and, and uh, fornication. It could be anything in here in our lives. How, how is it that we think we're going to have something better if we do it apart from God? We can't do better. We can't find better. We can't make things better if we do it apart from him, apart from his word, apart from doing the process and commit ourselves to, to do it according to his principles. I got news for you. I got news for me. Here, let me, let me just tell it to you this way, really straightforward, and this isn't to be harsh or anything, but I, I'm going to just tell you. You are not smarter than him. You are not smarter than God. And you can't trick him. If I get God's favor and I kind of do things right, then I can jump over here and kind of do my own thing a little bit and kind of blend it together. And mostly God and some of me and yeah, he'll be okay with it. You can't trick him. And if you come up with a good argument for him, he is not convinced. He's not sold on it. The only person you fooled is you. <sighs> that this is going to be okay. And all of a sudden we step into obedience. And all the guilt and all the shame and all the condemnation, we no, we no longer carry that around. And it no longer hinders us. Because now we're doing things God's way. Listen, I, and I'll go to the relationship thing because I brought it up. If 
But there's all kinds of things in our life. Listen, I have watched couples who believe in the Lord. They put their faith in him. And I've watched them. They, they get the cart before the horse. They, they move in together. They start playing house together. They have intimacy together. And I watch them struggle. And, and, and if they're honest with me and we'll talk and, you know, they're just, yeah, they're just, yeah, it's tough. And they're always carrying this thing and they try to get ahead. It's like putting, you know, it's like putting the tent back in the bag. <laughs> you just crazy, the uh, seams ripping and where the poles go and just throwing them aside. You just can't get it back in there. And then I watched them get the cart behind the horse. They do what's right in God's sight. They either part ways and abstain or they get married. Now watch what happens in their life and then their demeanor and their peace comes. They got the cart where it belongs and that can be for any of us anywhere over anything in our life. We can convince ourselves some false convincing that God's okay with it or there's some special understanding. I'm telling you, there is no something better if we do it apart from him. I don't care how flashy it looks. I don't care if you get to the end of the project and it looks like it's standing and it looks like it's success. Hey, listen. (laughs) The storms didn't come yet. The difficulties, the challenges didn't come yet. Just wait. God is smarter than you and I. Paul writes something interesting to the church in Galatia. It's in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 3. He says this. He says, you foolish Galatians. Like, what a thing to write to them. You're my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I just want to let you know. Foolish Galatians, it says, in some translations, who has bewitched you? Who has deceived you? And he says this, he says, that which you've started in God's spirit, this relationship with God, that which you've started in the spirit, you were doing it God's way. You weren't doing it apart from God. Your salvation was based on faith in him. And then he says, that which you started in the Spirit, now through time, Paul observes some things in them. And he says, now, though you started in the Spirit and with faith-based Christianity and faithfulness to God, now, someone who's deceived you that you're now trying to live out this faith by your own flesh works? Something's changed. Something happened. He says, who's deceived you? That that which you started out in the spirit, you're now trying to finish in the flesh. Listen, you and I, we can do the same thing. We can discover God's plan. We can commit our way to him. We can follow his instructions. And it's contrary to the ways of the world. It might be contrary to the ways of our own thinking. But you know what? We're going to do it. We're going to obey him. We're not going to just listen to his words. We're going to be doers of his word. We're going to do the processes in our life according to that, even when no one's watching, the privacy of our own thoughts and how we do things things in life and our attitude and all of that. And and all of a sudden, somewhere along the way, we now take it into our own hands. Like, God, I got it from here. Or, I really want this. Or, I want to do this. Or, I want to become this. Ah, I'm not, you know, I'm kind of concerned about your will enough to talk to you about it and try to get your blessing on it. We haven't surrendered to God's will, God's purpose, God's way of doing things. Listen, don't think you're going to build a better marriage if you're doing it apart from God. Don't don't think you're going to be a better parent if you're doing it apart from God. We can't be better on our own and doing things apart from God. I want you to remember that. 
when you walk through this week in, in your life, and you're at the office, or you're at home, or wherever it is, at school, privacy of your own house, and you're thinking about some things that are significant, and your attitude towards it, and how you're going to respond, or what you're going to do, I want you in that moment to not leave the discussion table where you're drafting up the blueprint of what you're going to say or what you're going to do or what you're going to try to accomplish or how you're going to uh, you know, try to persuade some people, manipulate some people or whatever to get to your way of thinking, whatever. Just as you're at the table drafting this blueprint, as you're at the table and you're thinking, you know, I got to really come up with a really persuasive thought here to convince my wife. You're drafting a plan. While you're still at the drafting table, with whatever it is, I want you to check your plan, your draft, your blueprint, with his word. Amen. And if you hear this, and don't do it, your plan is built on sand. I don't, care, I don't care how much you glitter it up. I want you in that moment to look at your plan and say, is it within the integrity of God's word and instruction of who, am I supposed to, of who I'm supposed to be as a person? That's what I've got to do at the drafting table. That's what I have to do at the drafting table. So what we need to do is we need to have this counseling of the Spirit. This counseling of the Spirit in our own hearts and our own minds. And that when we read it and we understand it, don't deceive ourselves by changing it to fit our agenda to give us a false peace that we're doing this with God. This is displayed so obvious in our lives. It's in this day and age, and in many day and ages. It's displayed in our country, in our government, all of these things. This is not a political message. I'm just saying there are examples out here of people trying to do things without God, apart from God. And I want you to know that those things will not succeed. Our draft and our plan should be that we're looking for a plan whose maker and builder is God. Why don't you stand with me, please? I want your life to be better. And it might be really good. It might not be so good right now. I want your life to be better. In every way. I want it to be better. I want you to desire uh, heaven on earth. You're supposed to pray that, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven heaven on earth. The key in what we call the Lord's Prayer is that it's about His kingdom and His will being done, not my plan. God sees what's done in secret. Say it with me. He knows what's done in secret. He, he sees it. He sees that. He sees what nobody else sees. I want us to remember that, not cr create a great fear and we're scared, but that he sees in private and what's done in private and how we manage our thoughts and our hearts. What he sees in private, he rewards. That's what he rewards. 
He knows if things are being done according to his word in your heart and life. The thing is, we can fool a lot of people like we're really wise, but God sees in our private life if we're really building on the sand or if we're building on the rock, the foundation of Jesus, the foundation of his word. It'll bring great peace to you. It'll bring less stress to you, less anxiety to you. Whatever you're drafting, let God be the architect and builder as you carry it out, as you, you're the laborer of it, you, it manifests in your life. Don't compromise that. Don't compromise that.